Hi, and welcome to Megasplat Development Log 19. Um, this is on the 1.08 version. Uh, I took a little time off, uh, basically just to uh, rest and focus on my day job, and uh, did a little travel. Uh, and so now I'm back and adding features to Megasplat. So, uh, there's two main new features in the patch, and then a bunch of bug fixes. Uh, bug fixes are always great, uh, but let's talk about the features. So the first one is uh, sitting before you, uh, and basically it's a system to take the puddles and make them look more like a river. Um, so the traditional puddles that were in um, in Megasplat were based off uh, Sebastian Lagarde's paper, which was about creating sort of puddles in city streets, which tend to be stagnant water. Um, they tend to have um, you know a lot of reflectivity and be sort of very flat from a normal perspective. Uh, and I wanted something that would allow me to get more of a river flow um, for these types of scenes. And uh, the other feature that's going on here is this foam uh, that we see around these rocks. And so basically what I wanted to do was not only uh, create the, the water surface and give it refraction, which you can see uh, happening right here, um, but I also wanted to uh, you know, sort of create the interaction with the surface of the train uh, as well with the, the sort of refraction you see, I mean the uh, foam you see going on here. So let's go over the new options. I'm just like my uh, train material here. And if we go down in the puddles mode, we now have puddle refraction. So when you turn this on, uh, it will use the normal map to refract the surface below it. This is definitely a little bit expensive. Uh, depending on what your other modes are. So the, the cost is that you have to um, sample and figure out the height for a given uh, value so you can figure out how deep the water is so that then you can sample the normal and figure out how much to refract uh, the given pixel uh, based on the water depth uh, and really whether there's water there or not. Uh, so that means resampling the diffuse arrays. Uh, so if you're on a two layer shader, that is a bunch of texture samples. Uh, that will need to be performed. Um, so one interesting thing is that there was already a feature, uh, Parallax Map, which if you're using that feature, then you're already going to resample these arrays. And so then this actually becomes very cheap. Um, so, you know, this could be an argument that, it, hey, if you're going to turn this feature on, go ahead and do Parallax Mapping because you're already resampling the arrays. Um, so there's a nice optimization there uh, if you were using that feature. Additionally, I have some ideas for uh, some optimizations that could be done um, to speed this up a little bit because we actually have to sample this normal a few more times uh, because of the way the code architecture is. Um, and so in the next patch, I'm going to look to uh, see if I can optimize that a bit and reduce the number of samples. Uh, and as usual with all Megasplat features, you can see your sample counts down here, uh, which is a nice thing to keep an eye on so you understand how expensive uh, various features are. Now, sample counts aren't, aren't everything in performance, but they are a pretty good indication of uh, you know memory ba uh, bandwidth issues and things like that. So the other feature is this Puddles Foam, which I have turned on. So maybe we should start by just going through the various puddle settings. So if I switch to Basic Puddles, which I was also going to turn off my foam, you'll see that they look a little bit different than they did before. And that's because there is now a slider called Normal Blend. So when Normal Blend is at 1, you get the puddles that um, we had in the previous version. So this is uh, the version of the puddle um, that, and let me turn off the raindrops for a moment. So this is the version of the puddles, uh, the very simplest version. This is almost a free technique. Uh, it's really not good for this. what this scene is, which is a river scene. Uh, what it is good for are sort of city street puddles, which tend to be very flat and just sort of give you this strong, flat, uh, specular response and darkening of the albedo. So the next mode is Puddles Flow, um, which if you're familiar with this, just basically adds flow mapping to this. And let me turn off the foam for now. And so here we get uh, some flow mapping, which made the puddles look a little bit better, uh, but not great. They still kind of look like puddles, maybe with wind blowing across them now. So um, we can add foam to this. And when I turn that on, the foam actually gets created. Now, this does, still doesn't have any refraction. So if you look closely, 
you'll see that uh, when you look through to the bottom of this river uh, that the surface is not refracting. Um, so you can still use the new foam feature and get a pretty good looking river uh, without the refraction. It looks better with the refraction, but that might be too expensive uh, for you, so now you have options to trade off there. Um, and then finally, we have the refractive mode. Let me turn that on, and I'm going to go ahead and turn off foam for now so we can just look at the refraction without the foam. So here we see it looks like puddles flow, um, but if you look, it's warping the surface below it. So you can see how it's um, shoving that surface around. Now, before we had set the normal blend up to one. So what this does is mean that we're blending to a flat normal. And that's because the surface of a puddle is completely flat. The problem with that is that we're viewing a surface underneath the water, which is not flat. And so that really needs its own lighting pass. Now, doing the lighting twice would be really expensive. Um, so instead, a much cheaper thing to do is to just allow some of that normal to come through. And as you lower this value, if you lower it all the way to zero, you're just going to get a, a rippling effect, which doesn't really have a surface. But if you bring it up a little bit, you'll get a little bit of that sort of flattening and that surface effect. But now you can see all the details in the stuff below the water, right? And so that really looks a lot more uh, like stream water, which we tend to think of as clear, as opposed to, to, to puddle water, which is this sort of, you know, disgusting, uh, dark stuff that we never want to uh, touch. Um, and so that sort of acts as uh, like a cleanliness of our water. We could think of it that way, even though it's, it's really just playing with the normals. Um, so we still have the tint, as we always had before, um, that you can play with. If you're not familiar with this, basically this allows you to brighten or darken the water a bit, change its color. Um, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 means you're not doing anything uh, with this, or 128 in these values here. So this, this will have uh, no tinting effect. Um, so you can use that to sort of brighten up the water a little bit, or give it a little bit of a hue, um, whatever you want. For now, we'll just leave it alone. Uh, obviously, you have the UV scale. And then now, what you have with the refraction mode is refraction strength. So when I turn this all the way down, I get no refraction, but as I move this up, you can see that it's distorting that bottom terrain more and more. And that tends to make the water look not only more turbulent, uh, but a little bit deeper too. Um, so you can play around with that until you get a value you like. And then the flow intensity and speed and modulate are the same as before. Um, another thing that uh, is worth talking about is porosity. So porosity is a representation of how porous a surface is, uh, because basically a really porous material is going to soak up more water and become more reflective and get a darkened albedo uh, versus a uh, smooth material, which won't be able to do that. So you can provide a per texture porosity, but most people, the global one is fine. And you'll see as I uh, decrease the porosity, I'm going to get uh, more porous surfaces effectively. This is kind of an inverted slider. Um, but it's going to become darker in the albedo and more shiny. And as I increase the porosity, it will have the water has less effect on the coloring of uh, the terrain underneath of it. And so I generally find, depending on whether you're going for rivers or puddles, that something like 0.4 is more like a puddle, and 0.6, maybe maybe as high as 0.7 is more like a very clean, you know, forest stream. Um, so yeah, so that's the refraction and the new uh, normal blend controls and uh, using porosity to sort of create the type of water uh, that you want. So let's go ahead and turn on the foam and I'll explain how that works. So I turn on the foam and what you'll notice is that the texture that I'm now using for my water, uh, it kind of looks a little bit like a, like a normal SAO map. It doesn't look like a traditional normal map. And that's because in this um, texture, in the blue channel, I have a value packed for, um, for the foam. Okay? And this is just a noise texture. It can be whatever you want. But I use the blue channel for the foam, and then I use uh, the red and green channels for the normal. So if you've packed in a normal SAO map, it's the same process. You just don't worry about the alpha channel. Uh, and you can put your foam uh, texture in there. Now, I've included one, so you probably won't need to do that. But if you want to mess with the foam texture, it can create very different uh, effects. Um, and you can get some, some different looking results. Same thing for the normal. Um, so 
Uh, the foam, when you turn that on, you now get a single slider for the strength of the foam. Okay, uh, I may expand this later to have some more controls, but what I wanted to do first is just get it to look good uh, on a single control. Um, and so what you'll see is that as I turn this up, uh, I get more foam in the water, and the foam in general tries to be uh, more pronounced around the rocks. Uh, and so that way you get that sort of turbulence around the rocks, but over here in this deep section, right, where it's, it's, there's no rocks, you don't see very much foam. There's a little bit in there, uh, sort of like, you know, extending along, but most of it is going to be around uh, these rocks, which, which really helps ground the whole effect and, uh, you know, make it uh, have a, a context awareness to the terrain that it's on that I really, really like. It took a while to figure out how to do that um, because just because of the way the data and the shaders work, it's a little tricky. Um, and so you can see over here where I have, this is actually a, a shallower water on a really rough surface, right? It's creating a lot of this foam because we have a lot of rough surface underneath of us and, and the water's not super deep. Um, so you get a lot more turbulence than up here where the water is deeper and these um, rocks are more, you know, they're more clear structures and so you just get the turbulence around the rock and not so much in the middle. Um, so that's really, really cool. I'm really happy with this, how this has come out so far. Uh, this, I have a bunch of ideas of how I could take this further, um, but uh, they're maybe not the highest priority thing until I get some feedback from users on uh, what they want out of this. Um, so yeah, so that is the new uh, settings for puddles and foam and refractive water, um, which are all very, very cool. I hope you enjoy them. And now let's talk about another feature. So I had a user ask for this. Um, it was pretty easy to do. So I went ahead and put it in. It actually shipped in the 1.07 version, um, but I did not do a video on that. So um, I'm going to talk about it now. And uh, let's find it here. So if you're familiar with the detail noise texture, I'm gonna go ahead and turn that on. I'm just gonna recompile the shader. Um, the detail noise texture, oh great, it's assigned and set up. As I zoom into the surface, you can see I get this other texture that's being blended in to create these details that wouldn't be there otherwise, right? And so that helps, you know, create this micro detail. And so uh, somebody was like, hey, I really want that for the distance so I can blend in a distance version of that. So we can go turn on, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this one off. And then I'm going to turn on distance noise texture. And what this will do is basically the same thing, but rather than only doing it when it's close up, it's gonna do it when it's far away. And so you can see how it's added all this noise. I'm using the same texture, because uh, again, it's the same te te uh, technique as the other one. It's added all this noise in the distance, which is giving this patterning to things. And again, you might you know, decide to change the scale of it, um, really lower it down, uh, or create a custom texture or whatever but you can get some nice patterning over the distance that way. And it works exactly like the other um, detailed noise texture, except instead of fading in as you're close up, it fades as you get far away. So when we're really close up, we don't see it, but as we move away, it'll start fading in and creating those uh, nice patterns in the distance. So if you find that your distance view is looking, um, you know, a little too, uh, consistent or whatever, you could use this technique. And again, you can change the blend amount and things like that to kind of uh, take the strength down maybe a little bit. We'll try it at 0.5. You can control your start and end fade um, so that you're not paying the cost when you're close up and you're not getting the effect when you're close up. Uh, and so you can get a nice subtle uh, distance sort of noise that, that gets put onto your train that way. Um, so simple feature, um, but useful uh, if you want to play around with with that and you're not using a macro texture or something like that where you might provide that detail. And so for features, that's basically it. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and talk about some of the bugs um, that were fixed in this. And there are quite a few here. Um, so in this one, uh, there was a bug where if you were converting from a traditional terrain um, to a mega splat terrain, uh, it would read the texture size of the train and try to create the, the train uh, for that. Uh, but people would go and they would 
change that texture size and then they would try to reconvert the terrain and then the texture size wouldn't match and then things would look really weird. So I went ahead and enforced that. So now what it'll actually do is it will uh, make sure that the terrain size uh, is the same size as the thing you're converting from uh, when it does the conversion. Um, there was this crazy uh, corruption bug with the texture graph where you would uh, be using the texture graph and you go into play mode and then it would just print world all over the screen. Uh, so I worked a bit to figure out what was going on there and managed to fix that one. Um, there was a uh, bug which is, uh, so if you're using the Map Magic uh, integration, um, which is really great, if you're using Map Magic, I suggest you give it a shot. Uh, it's nice to not have to convert things, it just works. Um, the t cluster scale wasn't actually exposed there, so I've submitted this back. Uh, to the repro that the Map Magic author uses, I don't think it's gotten into the official uh, Map Magic release yet. But uh, you know, if you have access to his uh, beta repository, or you know, I'm sure if you contact him, he can send you that. Um, and if you want, if you want to just fix the code yourself, uh, I can uh, just send me an email or something, and I'll I'll send you the um, the change so that you can make it because it's only a couple of lines. Uh, you know, cluster noise is very important to getting the look right in Megasplat. So, um, if you're doing, uh, map magic stuff with Megasplat, then it's a worthy thing to have fixed. Um, so I fixed a bug with ambient lighting not being applied, uh, correctly in a deferred rendering case. So, uh, basically the, um, lighting pipeline in Unity is like a minefield of macros and functions and, vertex interpolators and things that have to be uh, all done just right and uh, so it's very hard to make sure that every possible lighting combination is all working and I had missed one and a user sent me a nice repro case which after we fussed with it a bit and figured out how to get it to repro uh, then I was able to fix that for them. So if you're using deferred and you're doing uh, I think it was I think it was on some type of baked or no it was on uh, skybox lighting then this will fix that bug and things will ambient light correctly which is great and then I actually spent a bunch of time optimizing the editor because uh, basically if you if you're familiar with this immediate mode GUI stuff that all the unity editor stuff is written in um, what you'll find is that it allocates memory and it is not particularly fast um, it has a lot of uh, not great things when combined with C-sharp and the garbage collector. And um, basically there were just a bunch of places where I went through and I, you know, I would convert an enum value to a string and so I just started caching all that stuff and that sped up the editor a little bit. It was getting into this thing where when I was like changing these sliders, you can see how it little pauses happen there. And that's just uh, bits in the, in the Unity um, editor that start generating garbage and then the garbage collector has to come along. Um, so basically I tried to reduce the amount of garbage that was created significantly, um, which makes the editor more responsive, which is great. Uh, so that, that should hopefully be a lot nicer for people. Um, so yeah, I think that's it and I uh, hope you're having fun. Um, and if uh, you need any help, see me on the forums uh, and I'll talk to you then. Thanks. Bye.